Uh, we've hosted uh, quite a few of these now, so we're sort of getting used to them. Again, I want to thank um, our co-host, uh, Luke from Regen Farming as well for helping us with these webinars. Um, we're planning on continuing to do these over the next, you know, hopefully one a month. Um, we'll, we'll see how we go. So again, anyone has any ideas on some topics, please get feel free to contact us and we'll um, we'll happy to accommodate your, your wishes. Um, Jess, I might hand over to you now to uh, talk a bit about the housekeeping side of it um, and then you can introduce Luke um, and, and Luke can introduce Joel. Thanks, Jess. Good morning, everyone. Yep, so just basically um, with the chats and the question and answers, we will just be monitoring that. But we did speak about it and thought we'll let Joel do his presentation because most of the time you'll probably get your questions answered. Um, but yeah, you can ask your questions either in the chat or the question and answers box as well. Um, we do ask that you, you do keep it on topic because it can, can sway a little bit out of topic. Um, so we do ask that you keep it on topic, but yeah, me and Luke will will kind of go through them at the end and ask Joel these questions. So, um, and we are recording the webinar, so we will put that up in the next few days. Do you have anything else to add to that, Luke? Yeah, no, and once again, yeah, just leave your questions to the end. If you put them in the question and in the, in the Q&A box, it just makes it easier for us to, to see instead of trying to keep an eye on the, um, Chats. Yeah, on the, on the chat side of it just get, makes it fairly difficult um, but uh, anyway so I suppose we'll get on with um, with it um, we've got Joel here today uh, again fantastic educator um, and uh, we basically are, have asked him to to look at plant nutrition foliar fertilizers I deal with a lot of guys that put out different foliars at different times and and you get sort of different results and I think it's got a thing something to do with timing and all these other things all these other things. So um, hopefully Joel will touch on a lot of that today and, and the reasons for it. So anyway, over to you, Joel. Thanks very much, uh, Luke and uh, everybody. Great to be here again. And um, nice of you all to join on your Tuesday morning, isn't it? Yep, correct. <laughs> yeah, it's Monday, Monday evening here for me. So um, okay, so yeah, there's the topic a little bit on foliars and plant nutrition. Actually, we'll start off with um, plant nutrition and work our way towards some of the foliar uh, technologies and some of the um, tips and things on optimizing uh, the spray. And uh, yeah, as Luke mentioned there, it's, it's indeed true. There's a common kind of saying in the foliar world. Um, you know, it can often be a bit of a spray and pray approach. And that's what we really want to avoid by um, taking better control of some of those variables that influence the success. There's no doubt about it. Um, many people, both researchers and farmers alike, I think, have mixed views on foliars. And I think that comes down to the fact that it, the results can, can be uh, variable and, and sometimes inconsistent uh, in both ways, you know, both positive and negative. So um, that's what we really want to try and avoid by controlling some of those, those variables. Um, but nonetheless, it, I think there's good grounding, good foundation there for a, a good evidence base of, you know, the, the highlighting the potential uh, of the approach. Um, but certainly, I think we could all agree it's a, a work on work in progress, and um, um, many uh, a lot of room for improvement. There's definitely still a few blind spots and things in our in our knowledge, and um, yeah, that's uh, there is a lot of researchers working in that space. I've read some very recent things, recent papers on this, uh, kind of really diving deeper into some of these um, mechanisms and pathways of uptake and some of these variables. And I'll touch on some of that today. It is a big topic and uh, and also plant nutrition. I mean, we could do a whole day's course on plant nutrition. There's there's so much to say in relation to all of the roles and functions of those minerals and how they interact and, and all that kind of thing. So uh, we have a little over an hour or so for the presentation and then we'll have open up for some question discussion. And um, so we'll do the best we can in, in the time and uh, I've tried to cover a nice over, broad overview and uh, then we can dive a little deeper into your question, the specifics and the, the context um, through your questions during the discussion time. So here's just a quick outline of what we will cover. Start off uh, a little broad, just covering kind of uh, some of the functions and roles of, of some of the essential minerals. 
um, go through just, just the basics on kind of each of those and um, a couple of tips on those. And then we'll kind of move that talking more generally into a bit of a specific kind of case study on nitrogen. Uh, we'll talk about nitrogen metabolism and what the plant does with the different forms of nitrogen um, on the way to building that protein. And particularly then where we're going to focus more of our discussion on plant nutrition is really on some of the nitrogen synergists, things like magnesium, potassium, sulfur, that all play a role in nitrogen metabolism as, uh, as part of enzymes that help to catalyze the building of amino acids and the building of proteins, and particularly then some of the trace minerals as well, molybdenum, and my, uh, manganese and, and iron especially as well. Um, so we'll also touch on zinc and boron. Zinc also plays a role in nitrogen metabolism and um, <clears throat> that we'll touch on. And boron also, I think zinc and boron, very common uh, nutrient limitations in many parts of Australia, many Australian soils. And uh, I think it's worth including them um, to say a few things about them, especially boron. Uh, it has a very important role both for kind of early root development, which we don't talk about quite as much, but um, but also its role with reproduction and flowering and pollen production, those kinds of things. And really from there, we'll, that'll lead us into um, the final third or so of the talk, which will cover some of those uptake pathways and um, yeah, focusing particularly on the role of some carbon-based inputs, chelators and things, really helping to tweak the spray formulation and then uh, and apply it at the right time. Um, but tweaking some of that formulation to make sure that we build a, a liquid recipe there that's um, going to increase our chances of success. Okay, so <clears throat> let's dive into it. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I often start with this a slide like this one. It, it is ultimately photosynthesis that we are managing. It is this process. It is plants breathing in that carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen, taking up water and using that H and the hydrogen, the oxygen and the carbon, and using those as building blocks and energy from the sun to stitch those together to form glucose, uh, sugar, that first product of photosynthesis, uh, which then that building block ultimately through various metabolic pathways gets turned into everything that we see, the plant leaves, the stems, the shoots, the roots, uh, the flowers, the root exudates, you name it, everything that the plant is, that is made up of, that it needs, it ultimately all comes from uh, this process, getting water from the soil, uh, breathing in that carbon dioxide and stitching them together in that miraculous process uh, called photosynthesis that all life on earth has to thank um, for this beautiful little reaction that plants do. Now, of course, it's not just water and carbon dioxide and energy and sunlight that are the key ingredients. There's also one other critically important uh, ingredient for this process and this reaction to unfold, and that is the role of minerals, essential nutrients, the macro and the micro minerals. So yes, it's sun, air, carbon dioxide, water, plus the nutrition. And this is the piece of the puzzle that we also have to manage. And indeed, this is a, you know, of course, you've all heard the figures, you know, in terms of the plant biomass, most of the plant is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. 98% um, odd or so, um, it's only a very small percentage, you know, one or two percent that makes up the minerals and that's what's left in the mineral ash when we burn, you know, um, plants, burn plant material, uh, timber and that kind of thing, for example, we're left with the ash, those minerals, that essential macro and micro minerals that came from the soil. So they indeed, they only make up such a tiny percentage of what the plant is, but they form these enzymes, these catalysts that help to facilitate this reaction that we're seeing. We can't stitch these things. I've got the little plus symbols here. We can't stitch these things together uh, without the role of those minerals uh, helping to drive photosynthesis and therefore biomass production and everything that the plant is and, and needs. And that's the process. Uh, it's really saying the same as this little slide here, this simplified version. This is the exact same uh, uh, slide, but just uh, you know, written in a different way displayed in a different way here. Uh, so again, it's that carbon dioxide plus water, but we need the role of those minerals, macro and micro, and all of those essential macro and micros, which, which form enzymes. And that enzyme is just a catalyst. That's what an enzyme is. It's just a catalyst in a living system. Uh, and it helps to build that sugar molecule plus 
of course, the byproduct of oxygen that we are also so dependent on. So there it is, we have our little building block, uh, C6H12O6, that glucose molecule, and then the plant will use that as the building block to build absolutely everything. It all comes from that. Um, but again, in order to build all these other compounds and plant biomass and everything that comes from that simple sugar molecule, again, we need macro and micro minerals acting as various enzymes to catalyze, to stitch together these little glucose molecules, stitch them together, forming larger, longer chain, more complex sugars and carbohydrates, for example, um, linking in some nitrogen or sulfur, building those amino acids, linking those together to build those proteins, and, and onwards and onwards. All of these other compounds that uh, plants are and that they need all ultimately come from that building block, uh, stitching them together to form fats and oils, lipids, waxes, these kinds of things. Other hormones, those phytohormones, the auxins, the cytokinins, these kinds of things, um, and uh, even vitamins, uh, but also smells, scents, aromatic compounds or volatile organic compounds. All of these come also from that glucose and a range of other colors and pigments. And then those defense chemicals, you know, protective compounds, be that um, defense, uh, protective structures like spikes and spines and hairs that make it harder for insects to get through, for example, but also other internal defense chemicals, uh, systemic compounds that can have antihibivory or antifungal antibiotic type properties about them. And again, ultimately, all of those diverse and those thousands of different compounds that exist in plants, they all ultimately come from that building block and it just passes through all sorts of various different metabolic pathways and certain catalysts or enzymes are responsible for shuttling along those pathways, converting one thing to another, to another, to another, until it gets through to the metabolic pathway to build whatever that final product is. And again, of course, we need minerals and enzymes for this second stage as well. So the very obvious point to say is, is that, well, of course, if you have a deficiency of a macro or a micro mineral here or here, then this process is going to be limited. You will not have optimum photosynthesis, photosynthetic capacity, and therefore this will slow down. And then the second stage will slow down. Those metabolic pathways will slow down and you will not have good biomass production and good um, production of immunity, some of those defense chemicals or flavors or quality or smells. I mean, any of these things, uh, ultimately one way or another, they're going to impact on both yield as well as, as quality. And that can be very important for some of the higher value crops, you know, horticulturally speaking, or some of the herbs, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, these, this is a really important aspect to some of those other quality attributes as well. So therefore, it comes down to understanding of the roles and functions of some of the different minerals. And that's why it's important that we pay attention um, to those and some of the different um, aspects, some of the different functions in which they perform. And of course, it's as I was kind of trying to allude there, it's not just about yield, but of course, yield is an important consideration that we're all interested in. But I also just trying to point out here that um, it's not just yield and indeed the same mechanisms that lead to yield, you know, the same nutrients that help to build yield, ultimately just in different ways or different formats, ultimately also help to build those quality at attributes. So, or the pest and disease resistance, these things are all tightly coupled and interlinked. When we optimize the nutrition, not only do we improve yield, we do improve quality or plant immunity and these kinds of things. And okay, it says yield just in this picture to illustrate that, of course, if you then have a limitation and in any nutrient deficiency, and it could be absolutely anything, that of course, it doesn't matter how much more nitrogen we apply, how much more sulfur we apply or potassium we apply, et cetera, et cetera, it doesn't matter. If we don't address whatever the limitation is, uh, we will never be able to build that yield potential, quality potential, disease resistance, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same uh, as I say. So of course, it's therefore important to understand all of the nutrients that are essential for plant growth and be managing those accordingly. Now, being managing those accordingly doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be applying them. Uh, maybe they're adequate in present in adequate amounts, being cycled well enough in your soil. Um, so it's not to say that we necessarily have to apply them all, but indeed we need to be managing them all. We need to know that they're there, that they're present, that they're active, that they're being taken up, that they're functional within the plant. So this is where 
you know, the uh, plant tissue analysis or sap analysis, whichever one, um, you know, as long as we're using, uh, or, you know, again, the BRICS meter of some of those infield tools, as long as we're using some tools at our fingertips there to try and manage that nutrition uh, and ensure that we take a more holistic view and manage all of those, all of these uh, nutrients, um, because they are all important. And a deficiency or a limitation or an imbalance of any one of these, uh, ultimately, you know, going back to that photosynthetic slide, a, a limitation of any one of these ultimately will limit in one way or another the production of that glucose or those secondary kind of metabolic pathways that follow. In one way or another, if we have a mineral limitation, this uh, reaction will not flow properly, will not function properly, and therefore uh, we will be limited. So, Therefore, okay, and this is the slide we could spend, you know, the rest of the day on if you wanted to <laughs> and um, go through in detail all of these different nutrients, of course, what they do, um, how they're absorbed, different forms, different synergists, different antagonists. I mean, of course, it's a very intricate and interconnected and complex web. So, okay, we're going to cover just some of the summary points for today with a bit of a focus on nitrogen metabolism, as I mentioned, kind of do a bit of a nitrogen case study and consider some of the other nutrients along with nitrogen. But let's just take a quick summary of all of these just to start with, just to set that, to set the scene there. Um, nitrogen, as you all know, of course, it's the big yield builder. It's really important for, uh, for that, um, as we all know. And part of that reason is it's a part of the chlorophyll molecule. And um, therefore chlorophyll is the site of photosynthesis. So nitrogen along with magnesium, magnesium is the core and nit four nitrogens attached to that. And that's the site of photosynthesis. We can't do anything in the plant if we can't photosynthesize as we've just touched on. So, you know, if we have a limitation of magnesium or nitrogen straight away, you haven't got chlorophyll, you haven't got the site of photosynthesis active and functioning. Therefore, you're not going to have very good levels of anything else. You know, we, that's the factory, that's the little machine uh, engine in the plant we've got to be driving that. So nitrogen, of course, is critically important. And of course, it helps to, to drive yield. But we've got to have magnesium there with it in order to optimize that process. And uh, again, of course, so we'll talk about this. Nitrogen really important for amino acids and, and protein uh, synthesis, as we will, we will labor on this in detail. So then phos, of course, as you all know, phosphorus is part of, say, the ATP molecule. And uh, one of the big claims to fame for phosphorus, of course, is that uh, it's really important for uh, root development. So we do, do use it often as a starter fertilizer uh, in order to encourage that important root um, development. And uh, But particularly, you know, everything that the plant does requires energy, requires that ATP. So phosphorus really is important through all aspects of the, the plant life cycle, um, not just at the beginning for, for that really important rooting, which is really important, but even for all sorts of other things, especially energy intensive processes like uh, flowering or reproduction, uh, filling fruit, filling grain, you know, all these things can be very taxing um, or mobilizing those defense chemicals against um, pathogens and things. You know, this is all very energy intensive process. Um, so FOS is required indeed intrinsically throughout the plant. Potassium, uh, also really important in the latter stages for um, carrying sugars and carbohydrates into the developing grain. So potassium, really important during grain fill onwards kind of thing, um, really important at that stage. But it's also part of many enzymes that help to catalyze all sorts of things as well. Many, many different reactions in the plant, but also uh, nitrogen utilization, helping with that nitrogen metabolism and protein synthesis as well. Calcium, uh, as you're all probably aware, calcium is really important for cell wall strength. It gets deposited in those, uh, in those cell walls. Um, and uh, where it in increases the robustness of the plant. And it's not just calcium, it doesn't work in isolation there. Calcium works along with silicon. And okay, I snuck silicon into this list. Um, technically speaking, silicon is not an essential nutrient. Uh, silicon is a beneficial nutrient. But I think if we want to get serious about building, um, growing crops that are more pest and disease resistant, lowering our dependency on, uh, on pesticide inputs. Well, silicon can really help in this department. It's that building the thickness, the toughness, the robustness of those cells uh, 
that silicon does in tandem with calcium and boron kind of acts like the glue to glue them together. Um, they all get deposited in the cell walls and they all increase that thickness of the skin or the robustness of the skin of the plant, um, thereby leading to, to greater um, pest and disease resistance. So calcium really important for that aspect along with silicon and boron, but indeed calcium is really important for the root tips, for the shoot tips. It's calcium's kind of really um, big important function is cell division. So at the root tips and at the shoot tips, it's growing initially by cell division. And once those cells have divided, then they expand. And that's where potassium comes in to help expand those cells. Um, but initially the growth is all through cell division. So calcium really, really important for uh, shoot tips and root tips. Uh, additionally. Uh, magnesium, as we've touched on, uh, has a very strong link with chlorophyll, but also, uh, to be fair, as I'll touch on later, also plays a really important role, again, in nitrogen metabolism, in protein building. Uh, actually, more of the magnesium in the plant is used for nitrogen building than it is for chlorophyll production. So we often talk about chlorophyll, it's, it's claim to fame, but uh, actually, if you were to look at how what magnesium is doing in the plant, most of it is actually working with nitrogen to build protein, um, not necessarily build chlorophyll. Um, okay, sulfur is of course the other one that is tightly linked here with nitrogen. Uh, sulfur also helps with uh, building protein because we have some of those sulfur bearing amino acids. So uh, we uh, sulfur plays a very important role to build really complete and quality proteins, as I'm sure you all are aware while we often use a bit of nitrogen and sulfur in combination. Now, sulfur is also quite important for root development, and that's particularly true in legumes and the pulses. Uh, sulfur has a very important role in, in helping to um, encourage nodulation uh, down below. So particularly important for legumes, but also plays a role generally with root development. Sulfur also is an important um, immune enhancing. Many sulfur bearing compounds can have um, fungicidal type properties. So as, as any of organic farmers out there would know who may use sulfur as a, as a spray for, fungus, for its fungicidal properties, but indeed there is also internal defense chemicals that are sulfur bearing within the plant that can also enhance the uh, disease resistance uh, of the plant. So sulfur also has an important role there with plant health, uh, plant immunity from a disease point of view. Um, silicon, as we touched on already, and boron as well, being the glue to help calcium and silicon to, to um, reinforce those cell walls. But boron is other big claim to fame is definitely the reproductive processes. So really important for flowering, uh, pollen production or fruit set or grain set, these kinds of things, ensuring the flowers get pollinated and good pollen production, that kind of thing. Um, but also sugar translocation, it also plays a role, particularly translocating uh, reserves and energy down to the roots. Uh, this is the big one. And this is especially important on brassicas. Uh, brassicas really respond well to a bit of starter boron, like starter foz, like in the same way we consider starter foz. We could almost argue that we should have a bit of starter boron um, with that package, but especially so for the brassicas, they really, really respond to those early boron applications in terms of really good root production, good root biomass production early on. And of course, that, that big root system early on can set you up uh, for you know, good moisture and nutrient scavenging from the soil for the rest of the season. So uh, indeed, boron is uh, often overlooked, but uh, very important, very important nutrient as well. And copper is, uh, again, like the sulfur example, of course, we all know copper is commonly sprayed as a for its fungicidal properties, particularly in organic systems. But uh, indeed, actually, copper plays a role in disease protection internally as well. Um, it, it actually helps the, the, the plant to, again, toughen up the skin of the plant, uh, but through different mechanisms by encouraging things like lignin and cellulose and some of those structural compounds. Um, but also some of these def other defense systemic kind of defense chemicals as well. So copper really helps with disease resistance internally, not just by foliar spraying it externally onto the leaf, but um, getting it into the leaf and as a valuable uh, nutrient within the plant, also for protection against disease. Now, zinc is a really important one that um, has a, a very tight relationship with uh, auxins and uh, auxins are really important for root development. Uh, encouraging good root biomass, 
uh, but they also play a role in governing leaf size. And of course, the leaf size is the, your leaf is the solar panel. So the bigger we have that leaf, the bigger the solar panel, uh, the more potential we can capture that sunlight and uh, drive that photosynthetic process. Uh, manganese is really important also fundamentally for photosynthesis. It plays a role in splitting water that feeds into that photosynthetic process, but also manganese is really important for reproductive processes, seed maturation, but also seed germination at the start of the season as well. Um, so often we see manganese-based seed treatments for that reason. Uh, has an important role in helping to enhance germination and establishment, um, but also uh, later on during the reproductive processes as well. Now iron, as you all know, very important for greening up of the plant, and that's because iron, although it's not part of the chlorophyll molecule, indeed it um, plays a role in the synthesis of that chlorophyll, and indeed zinc also plays a bit of a role here too, but um, iron really important for the synthesis of chlorophyll. And that's why we see that nice greening up from applications of iron. Uh, it's uh, or when we have iron deficiency, we see that classic pale yellowing, that classic chlorosis, um, often so evident with iron deficiency. So that's the reason why critical for the synthesis or the production of that, that chlorophyll molecule, that green pigment there that drives uh, all these processes we're talking about. Um, Okay, so uh, moly, also really important for nitrogen utilization. Uh, we'll talk about this in detail. Some of these other trace minerals, we'll move on to talk about these now. Uh, really important for um, nitrate conversion, uh, really important for nitrogen fixation. We'll, we'll talk about this. Cobalt also plays a role for end fixation, in legumes, specifically in legumes. And then nickel uh, as part of the urease enzyme. And urease is the enzyme that helps to um, convert urea in the plant. Uh, onwards into uh, aminos, well, ammonium and then aminos and proteins. And we'll go through this uh, at length now. So, okay, so let's take a dive. That's kind of a broad overview. I was just trying to cover a, uh, like a crash course in plant nutrition there, but let's, kind of, let's try and give it context through a discussion, a case study of nitrogen, and we'll, we'll kind of feed in some of those other minerals um, as, we, as we go along. Um, trying to avoid, oh, okay. Oh, hold on. Now I've lost my... Okay, here we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so here's the metabolic pathways for nitrogen and the different forms of nitrogen that come into the plant. So we do have nitrates, uh, we have urea, and of course, ammonium can be taken up directly. And here I'm obviously covering the inorganic forms of nitrogen. Um, although technically urea is an organic form, it has carbon embedded in it, but that's another story. Let's, let's put it in the category of inorganic for now, just because it's often one of our main fertilizer inputs. So when the plants take up nitrate, they need to, first they have to reduce that nitrate into nitrite, and then from nitrite into ammonium. So that's the pathway that will happen. And in order to do that, the plant requires moly, sulfur, and iron. So moly and sulfur, they're really important for that nitrate reductase enzyme, and iron is really important for the nitrite reductase enzyme. So that's the first step in converting or reducing nitrate into uh, ammonium, because the plant doesn't want nitrates. At the end of the day, it wants proteins. This is the goal. We're, we're trying to build protein. This is the, the end of the pathway is kind of where, what we're chasing here. Um, we don't really want these inorganic forms, we want protein. So we have to convert them. And that's that first step to get that into ammonium. Now, equally same with urea. Urea uses that urease enzyme that I mentioned, and nickel is part of that enzyme. We can't build urease without nickel, so we can't process urea. And urea also gets um, uh, via hydrolysis. It is also converted, um, so we add water, that simply means to create um, two ammoniums, NH3 and NH3, which then also rapidly get converted into that ammonium plus CO2. So point being is that urea also gets converted first into ammonium, uh, as does nitrate. So that's the key nutrient. If you do not have moly, sulfur or iron, nitrates can build up. There's like a backlog. If you do not have nickel, urea can build up. Now, once we get that ammonium, Okay, next we need manganese and magnesium. And these two nutrients are really important for the enzymes that help to convert that ammonium into uh, the, amine, the very first amino acid, glutamine, uh, as part, which is part of the glutamine and glutamate cycle, which 
basically through that gets turned into um, onwards and shuttled around all sorts of other, other metabolic pathways to turn into all of the other amino acids. So manganese and magnesium nonetheless play a really important role at the start of that process. So they're really important. Ultimately, now we've made a switch from these inorganic forms. Now we've hit the amino acids. Now we've got the organic forms of nitrogen uh, in the plant. And once we have all those amino acids, well, then the plant just stitches those together in different arrangements and different ways to build a whole host of different proteins, all sorts of many hundreds and thousands of proteins that the plant builds. Now, certain, there's a lot of, therefore, because proteins come in a, a diverse array of compounds, um, there's a lot of different enzymes or catalysts that help to convert that process. So there's a lot of nutrients ultimately that are involved in protein synthesis, but I guess I would really emphasize, I think the top three, the folds, the sulfur and the mag, these top three are particularly important for that protein synthesis um, aspect. So these are really, really important at these latter stages of, of protein synthesis, but also again, manganese, boron, potassium, as I mentioned, zinc, um, also uh, playing a role. So the point is just to highlight here that if you have a limitation of any one of these nitrogen synergists, these other elements that work with nitrogen to help convert or metabolize that nitrogen, you will have these backlogs. And again, as I say, the plant doesn't want nitrates, doesn't want urea, doesn't really want ammonium. It doesn't necessarily want amino acids either, although they're very important as um, to, as mobility, this is how the plant moves nitrogen around the plant, mainly through amino acid translocation. Um, so they're very important. They have very important functions um, from a translocation point of view. But once they get to where they're going, it's all about then re restitching those together and building those proteins. This is really the end goal. This is kind of what the plant ultimately wants. And of course, that's important for us. We're interested in protein as well from an animal feed point of view, but also from a, um, a human feed um, food point of view with grain protein for, for obvious reasons as well. So, so just to then summarize and say that, as you can see, nitrogen is not an island. It works in tandem, in concert with all of these other elements. And this is why we need more holistic plant nutrition. We can't just manage nitrogen and put nitrogen on and think our a job is done. You've got to be managing all of these other nutrients that work with nitrogen to help it through this metabolic pathway. Uh, otherwise, we have those backlogs. And just quickly, not the topic of today, but also if we think about nitrogen gas and nitrogen fixation, well, um, again, we need specialist enzymes to facilitate this process. And there's a long list here as well, but um, moly and iron are probably the two, the two most important ones. They form part of that nitrogenase enzyme. But we also need nickel and fos just purely from an energy point of view. The M fixation is really energy intensive. So definitely fos, I would argue these four are really important for that end fixation. But if we, like all end fixation, but if we were to add legumes specifically on top of that, we could also say calcium is really important, boron, uh, cobalt, and copper. They could also be added to that list on top of those four, um, particularly from a legume point of view. So again, you can just see this, this nuance that everything is interlinked and all of the nutrients are really important. And just to emphasize that plants do not just take up these inorganic forms, the ammonium or the nitrate or the urea. Okay, technically urea is an organic form, but just to emphasize that plants can take up actually amino acids directly from the soil. The plant can take up small proteins uh, directly from the soil. As I'm sure you, many of you are aware of the rhizophagy cycle, plants can even take up engulf whole bacteria. Whole bacteria are much larger than proteins or amino acids. So, so yes, the plant can take up these more complex compounds. And there are a lot of benefits to that because um, now we've already given amino acids to the plant. We're already giving proteins to the plant. And ultimately that's saving the plant's energy down here. If the plant doesn't have to build nitrate reductase enzyme and urease and build all these enzymes to facilitate these um, kind of downstream processes, if we're just feeding amino acids directly or feeding proteins directly, well, this is called metabolic shortcutting. We're shortcutting this process and giving these higher quality forms of nitrogen or organic forms of nitrogen. So this is a huge and overlooked piece of the puzzle. We're so focused on fertilizers and therefore most of those are inorganic nutrients that we've kind of missed or um, over-focused on one half, missing the, the balance to the discussion, which is that these organic forms of nitrogen are actually very efficient uh, to feed the plant sources of nitrogen. So 
it's just an important nuance to, to say there. Okay, so um, let's, I, I've kind of covered some of this, so I'm gonna just maybe rehash these points, but just to make sure I keep on time here, but um, I don't wanna overlap too much. So just to say, okay, nitrogen, you all know, it's really important. It's important for DNA, chlorophyll, as I mentioned, protein. Um, and the point there is that previous slide is just to say that, okay, if we just push nitrogen without those adequate synergists, you're not gonna see um, adequate uh, um, movement of nitrogen through that metabolic pathway. So that's gonna lead to an unbalanced crop. Too much nitrates, not healthy. Too much urea, that's gonna cause scorch. We need to convert that urea. Um, too much ammonium equally can cause ammonia toxicity and imbalances. So you've got to figure in and, and factor in, sorry, um, all of these other, these kind of minerals. So here I'm just going into a little detail, a little bit of um, detail of what I'd kind of skimmed over there. So moly, it is really important for that protein synthesis, um, specifically for the nitrate reductase. We can't, we can't convert nitrates um, into nitrites without um, moly. Um, so that's as, as I was kind of saying there. And from there, it forms that ammonium and then from there onwards to those uh, amino acids. So this moly is a really important one. And as I mentioned, iron and sulfur also uh, play a role in that pathway as well. Um, but as I touched on, uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, they also really require moly, especially moly and also iron, to build that nitrogenase enzyme. And that's the enzyme that can grab onto nitrogen gas and bring that into the plant. So if we want free nitrogen, of course, it's really important to talk about the efficiency of how we convert the nitrogen that we apply. That's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, but also, if we want some free nitrogen from atmospheric, from the atmosphere, uh, well, then we also really need to focus on moly um, in or, and iron in order to build those special enzymes that can help us unlock nitrogen gas and bring that into the system as well. And as I mentioned, iron, again, it's part of that second stage of the nitrite reductase enzyme, but also chlorophyll synthesis, as I mentioned. And again, iron is also part of the nitrogenase enzyme. So again, playing a role in all multiple aspects of uh, nitrogen metabolism. Now, sulfur is key. There's many of those sulfur-bearing amino acids. Um, so therefore, we can't build complete and complex proteins without some of those sulfur-bearing uh, amino acids. Uh, root development, as I mentioned, disease resistance, and also that nodulation process in, in legumes. Uh, so sulfur and nitrogen, you know, really go hand in hand. Uh, we often hear this kind of ratio of around about um, 10 to 1. So for every 10 parts nitrogen, um, we need one um, sulfur there. And that's kind of an optimum ratio, this 10 to 1 there, to support good protein uh, synthesis. So if we have too much nitrogen and not enough sulfur, and then we have uh, too wide of a ratio there, it can really limit um, uh, limit good protein synthesis. Okay, nickel is the one I also mentioned. That's what helps to liberate the urea, break it apart so the plant can use that nitrogen. Um, however, if we do not have nickel, uh, if we do not have urease, urea can build up and become toxic. And we can uh, apply, for example, nickel sulfate. It's very small amounts. There's been some good work shown on barley with a 0.2% solution. Um, but I've also know other farmers um, can kind of have had success around this kind of 50 odd grams, some a bit lower, 30 grams, some 80. Uh, but I guess on average, I think a good, a good kind of rate is about 50 grams per hectare. Um, so you can see very small amounts indeed uh, that I used, but I also would not suggest applying nickel um, willy nilly, so to speak. Um, you know, it is still heavy metal. We do need to be mindful of it. Um, some of the soils that are more likely to be deficient in nickel would be higher pH soils. So nickel is very available under acidic soils. So if you've got very acidic soils, probably the nickel that you have in your soil is going to be quite available. Um, and also soils that have a history of organic amendments, compost or manures, this kind of thing. Um, those are usually going to have a, a, uh, a nickel component in them as well. So you've probably addressed a bit of nickel through the organic amendments, compost and that kind of thing. So the kind of the candidates that where nickel could be an issue is high pH soils with very no history or very little history of organic amendments, compost manures, that kind of thing. Those would be maybe the, the, uh, the scenario there where maybe you wouldn't want to consider um, including a small amount of nickel, particularly if you were doing a foliar urea spray. 
Now, manganese also important for germination. Uh, it also plays a really important role in disease fighting nutrients, uh, both for primary and secondary defenses. So that's for toughening up the skin of the plant through kind of, again, callus formations, this kind of thing, lignification, um, but also some of these defense chemicals, systemic defense chemicals. Um, so manganese plays a really important role there. And as I mentioned, and converting that ammonium ultimately into the amino acid as well is also really important, along with magnesium was the other one there. But also magnesium is so central for chlorophyll, the engine of the, of the, of the plant. We can't do anything without that chlorophyll. So uh, it works with nitrogen to build chlorophyll. Uh, really, really important. Um, but as I mentioned there, actually it also plays a very important role in that amino acid synthesis and ultimately later on that protein synthesis as well. So magnesium is a, a really important one. And uh, okay, there we have uh, just an image um, illustrating that, that process there. Okay, just a quick um, word on boron so we can keep moving along here. Um, uh, I touched on boron, its importance with uh, calcium and silicon, um, but it also plays a role in building of other structural compounds to protect the skin of the plant. So lignin, for example, um, these polyphenols, these are again, part of those primary defenses, uh, first line of defense, the, the skin of the plant. Um, boron, also really important for root growth or carrying sugars, carrying energy down to the roots. Like calcium, uh, boron is really important for the growing tips in the shoot tips and the root tips along with calcium. And both those two nutrients are very immobile, both calcium and boron, highly immobile. Sulfur quite immobile as well would be the other big one. Um, and there was a question there about, yeah, nutrient mobility. Um, that we had ahead of the um, ahead of the webinar here, um, yeah, and it's it's just the question here was kind of about seeing how, how do we find reliable sources on the mobility of nutrients, and and yeah, I would say you'll find pl plenty of resources uh, online using Google, but operative word there is reliable sources, and and one of the tricky things that probably you've noticed um, as to there's a real mixed bag of kind of answers to this is that. Actually, some nutrients are more or less mobile um, in different contexts, i.e. in different plant species. Um, so it's not just when we say all oh, certain things are mobile or immobile, it can be that certain nutrients are mobile uh, for some plants, but in other plants, they're not. So, you know, example um, of that would be that zinc has some um, intermediate mobility, for example, in wheat, in cereals. Um, but in so, some kind of um, tree nuts, pistachios, this kind of thing, it can be actually highly immobile. So there's a little bit of context dependency there. And that's probably why um, you've seen some of these maybe mixed um, results, uh, mixed comments, sorry, uh, maybe online and some of your reading. The, the best way to kind of just generally summarize this is that, you know, MPK for sure are highly, highly mobile. So they're the big three, MPK and magnesium, that's the other one. So those are your four that are highly, highly mobile. And manganese, again, in some instances and in some crops um, can be also quite mobile. Um, but those are the big four that are highly mobile. And at the opposite extreme, the highly immobile nutrients would be your calcium, your boron, uh, your sulfur, your silicon would be another one. They're the ones at the opposite extreme that are highly, highly immobile. And really everything else is kind of what's called intermediate, intermediate mobility. And again, that's kind of what I was talking about there, a bit of case-by-case -case scenarios. Um, they have some mobility, but maybe not great mobility like MPK and magnesium, for example. So all of your other um, traces there have intermediate. And as I'll talk about in a few slides, um, it depends on what form they're in. If they're chelated, um, especially with amino acid chelation, those nutrients can then be much more mobile because the amino acids are highly mobile in the plant. So any nutrients or min minerals attached to those amino acids then get dragged along for the journey. So, um, so it's not an easy, quick answer to answer that one, but just to say that MPK and MAG are the highly calcium, magnesium, calcium boron, um, silicon, sulfur, the highly immobile and kind of everything else uh, a little bit in between. Um, Okay, zinc, uh, I, I touched on this solar panel. So of course, more zinc, more solar panel, more photosynthesis, also playing a role in nitrogen metabolism. Um, I can see time's flying as always, as it always does. Okay, so just a quick comment here, just to say that, um, you know, when we then talk about the different fractions of forms of nitrogen, sorry, and the meta those metabolic pathways, 
you can see here just a really nice visual example that in order to turn ammonium into that very first amino acid that I mentioned, glutamine, once ammonium is absorbed, you can see that it's a, a one-step process. There's one enzyme that catalyzes this process, um, therefore leading to, to glutamine. Conversely, when nitrate comes into the plant, you can see it's a lot longer metabolic pathway. First, that nitrate has to be uh, reduced to nitrite, and then nitrite has to be, uh, again, energy expended to, um, to get it into uh, from one part of the cell to the next. And then we reduce that nitrite to ammonium, and then we convert that ammonium into the glutamine. So you can see this is a multi-step process, and consequently, nitrate is less efficient uh, form of nitrogen, meaning there's a greater metabolic drawdown, uh, a greater energetic drawdown in order for the plant to build all these enzymes and uptake channels um, in order to convert this ultimately into glutamine as compared to ammonium. So ammonium is a preferred source uh, versus nitrate. But you, although urea was further back on that path, as I mentioned, urea um, also feeds into ammonium, but urea has a special uh, exception to this is that that carbon that was embedded in it, it's that, that embedded carbon in the urea is what helps to also make urea a very um, efficient form is that that carbon feeds into photosynthesis, um, thereby saving metabolic energy on a very expensive process of photosynthesis. So urea has a bit of an exception to the rule there where that embedded carbon actually adds to its ultimate efficiency. So it's, it's also a, a very good one. And okay, that was just summarizing what we've touched on before with some of those essential nutrients that are required. And the other point to say here is that when the plants take up ammonium, that conversion of ammonium into that glutamine happens in the roots. And so by default, that means that ammonium generally encourages more root biomass, more rooting growth, whereas the nitrate or the bulk of the nitrate, the vast majority of the nitrate, some small amounts can be converted in the roots, but the bulk of the nitrates are sent up to the leaves where uh, that conversion happens up in the leaf. And so consequently, we see that nitrates generally encourage more above ground biomass because that's where the conversion is happening. So then the metabolic products get used up in the leaf, whereas the metabolic products get used down in the roots for ammonium. So generally we see that ammonium dominant plants have better rooting, um, but perhaps slightly smaller above ground, whereas nitrate plants have smaller roots and slightly better above ground. And that's an important nuance because we might visually think that the nitrate plants are doing better because they're a bit more top heavy, visually looking better above ground. But actually, particularly in dry climates like Australia, actually that investment in early root growth is really important because you're establishing a bigger, better root system earlier on, prioritizing that root system, which once you have that bigger root system, then you can scavenge more moisture and nutrients from the soil um, and catch up later on in the season. So um, I think uh, trying to, to minimize too much nitrates uh, is important. But that said, nitrate is, small amounts is okay in the vegetative stages. Earlier on is okay, um, in the, generally in the vegetative stages. But once we switch to kind of reproductive stages, it's really much better to be using, uh, urea would be my uh, important choice. And um, just as then to say that, okay, we, the plants can also take up nitrogen through the foliar. And uh, this can be a very efficient way of feeding nitrogen to the plants, because when we apply nitrogen to the soil, as uh, I'm sure some of you know, um, particularly urea can volatilize off as ammonia, as, as gas, um, or other forms can also be converted into nitrates and then also leached. So by applying to the foliar and bypassing the soil, we can get those nitrogen forms directly into the plant, preventing some of those losses and therefore um, seeing some efficiency gains. Now, different forms of nitrogen are absorbed at different speeds. And here's the order of the speed of absorption here. Amino acids are the fastest to be absorbed. Urea is the second fastest, then, and these are very close, these two, um, but then ammonia moves slower and nitrate um, the slowest. So speed of absorption is important because we want it to get into the plant as quickly as possible. The longer the nitrogen is sitting on the leaf, the more likelihood it's going to get washed off or volatilized off, uh, for example. So we want to get it into the plant where then it is sequestered in the plant and captured and where it can be used. So consequently, when we talk about foliar nitrogen, I would lean towards amino acid, uh, urea-based foliars, but that's not to say that a component of ammonium or nitrate present is 
is also okay, is fine, um, but we definitely want to be prioritizing, kind of leaning towards these two. And the reason these two are preferred uh, or are fastest is because they have carbon embedded. That's coming back to that point earlier about urea. And it is that carbon embedded in the amino acids in the urea that helps it pass through the leaf faster. And we'll talk about this in the final stages of this lecture. Okay, protein hydrolysates, um, are like fish hydrolysates, I think are ideal um, to mix some of those with urea. And that kind of ticks these two boxes, pro providing some aminos and some uh, urea. Now, just FYI, urea can also improve the uptake of other nutrients. So urea itself can be somewhat like a chelator, and particularly with some of the trace minerals, especially zinc, iron as well. Um, when we mix iron or zinc with urea, uh, say zinc sulfate, for example, with urea, actually that urea helps the zinc get into the leaf more effectively. So urea itself is a really good synergist with other nutrients um, because of that speed of absorption that it has. And just some guidelines here in terms of foliar application rates. You know, people do lower or higher. It really depends. There's a whole nuance to this. But just to kind of frame the discussion um, and uh, give some ballpark kind of figures, you know, urea can be often used. I'm talking about product here. Um, so 10 to 20 kgs of product um, per hectare. And that kind of a ballpark seems to work well. Um, UAN or UAS, again, in that 10 to 20 liters kind of range. And again, I know people use a range of kind of numbers here, but okay, just trying to um, give you some kind of guideline, rough guide guidelines. Uh, ammonium sulfate, even as low as a couple of kgs can work, but five and okay, in horticultural crops, maybe even higher up to seven or eight. Um, but, you know, in that kind of ballpark. And then fish hydrolysates as well, I think are good, good options two liters per hectare, up to five, it depends on the economics of the product, of course. But um, I think, again, my point would be there's a real synergy to combine some of these organic forms like amino acids, say a fish hydrolysate with some of these inorganic forms. They do work kind of well synergistically uh, together. Okay, I've, I'm, I'm gonna scoot through this uh, because I've pre pretty much, this was just to summarize everything that we just said and make this point to say, okay, if we're managing nitrogen, it's not just about managing nitrogen. Um, we also need these other nutrients that we talked about to be part of those enzymes to convert that nitrogen through those metabolic pathways, potassium, magnesium, sulfur, zinc, we mentioned manganese, iron, moly, and nickel. So these are all of these actually, we have to manage all of those just to manage nitrogen to ensure that it's passing through that metabolic pathway. And if I add to that list some of the other nutrients that are required for nitrogen fixation as well, false for energy, as I mentioned, calcium was important in legumes, boron was important in legumes, copper was important in legumes, iron, moly, uh, and nickel were those big ones along with false, and cobalt also important for, uh, for legumes. So again, you can see lots of other nutrients are also required to manage that nitrogen fixation process if we want free nitrogen. So if we bring these two ideas together, well, if you want to fix lots of free nitrogen and or metabolize the nitrogen that you apply most efficiently, you can see that you pretty much need complete plant nutrition. You need everything. Uh, okay, silicon is the one off the list there, but technically not essential, of course. So you need all of the nutrients and that's the take home message. Um, use a tissue analysis, use a SIP analysis, use tools to identify other nutrient limitations and bring those together with your nitrogen applications. That's the, that's the take home message. Okay, so hopefully we've got just enough time. I've got about 15 minutes left to hopefully get through this last section. Let's see how we go. This is also a kind of a big discussion. Again, we could do like a really deep analysis on this, but um, I think I just wanna cover some of the key tips, uh, the key takeaways uh, for you um, uh, that we can then maybe have some discussion in. Uh, in the last section. So let's look at then how nutrients pass through the leaf and some of these various uptake pathways. So the benefit to feeding through the foliage <clears throat> is that there's opportunities for efficiency gains. We are targeting the nutrients directly onto and then into the foliage, on, into that canopy, into through that foliage, and therefore bypassing the soil. And it is the soil and those interactions, the leaching, the volatilization, um, nutrient lockups or antagonism, nutrient competition for uptake, all of these interactions ultimately lead to lower efficiencies through soil-based applications. So we can bypass all of this and just deliver small and targeted amounts of nutrients directly into 
into the into the foliage and into the plant. Okay, and that's that's part of the motivation. And when fertilizer prices are as high as they are this year, uh, this is a good motivation to be uh, trialing a using a, a foliar approach. So the main uptake pathways, and this is where we could go in deep, but I won't. I'll just cover the key take homes. Um, traditional view was that the cuticle and the stomata were the two um, kind of pathways for uptake. Uh, we have some very recent reviews and updated kind of literature on this now, um, highlighting that there are other, uh, there are other pathways, but um, such as the trichomes, and the trichomes is kind of those fine hairs uh, on the plant, um, and some of those uh, trichomes are also called glandular trichomes, and these are little organs in the leaf that are the, the sites where they the plants release those smells and scents, the volatile organic compounds, uh, these kinds of things. So we now know actually, particularly in sunflower, um, for sure, uh, really important, and soybeans, that these trichomes also play a, an important role uh, for nutrient absorption. So it definitely appears that the top three are the main ones, the cuticle, the stomata, and the trichomes. But we also have evidence that shows that the cells immediately adjacent to the veins in the leaves, that these have a, a particularly a higher uh, hydrophilic capacity. They can really take in water and, and, and solutes accordingly, and some other um, kind of structures on the leaf, uh, epidermal structures, so other spines and spikes and, and other kind of things that, um, but this is definitely the lesser important one. Uh, the top four are the, are the main ones, especially the top three. Now the traditional view was that the cuticle was the number one, the, the primary and um, the bulk of the nutrients pass through the cuticle, the cuticle being the kind of waxy layer uh, on the surface, over the surface, uh, coating the epidermal cells, coating all, all surfaces of the plant. Um, we're now beginning to think that actually that the stomata play maybe an even more important role. Uh, and certainly on some crops like soybeans and sunflowers, actually the stomata and the trichomes are the dominant pathways and the cuticle somewhat getting bumped down this list. Um, there's some contention over how important the cuticle really is. Um, and I'll touch on this just super briefly, but it's a, it's a rather entangled conversation, that one. But okay, just to point out that there are, okay, many different um, structures in the leaf or and modes, pathways for uh, the nutrients ultimately to be absorbed uh, into that leaf. And here's just a nice visual example of this. So here's that cuticle I was talking about. This is kind of a, a waxy layer uh, on the skin on top of the epidermal cells. And again, the kind of the traditional view was that the cuticle has a lot of these micro pores uh, in it, these tiny um, little holes. And under humid conditions, those pores will open. And when those pores open under humid conditions, the nutrients will indeed uh, pass through those micro pores. So that's been the, um, the traditional view. There is some contention on this now. One of the current kind of theories is that actually perhaps that the cuticle um, which is, uh, is actually not all waxes and hydrophobic compounds. It's actually a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic compounds. So there's a, there's a suggestion here that it may actually go through a little bit more of a shrink swell behavior. And it is that shrink swell behavior of that cuticle that ultimately creates spaces for um, gaps and cavities for water to kind of penetrate through and, and solutes to travel with it. Um, so this is somewhat contested now, but, but nonetheless, the cuticle is still a, 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 a site, a pathway for absorption, perhaps just the specific way in which it does it is contested. Um, but however, the stomata now, as I say, also emerging as a more important than we used to think. We know that the nutrients applied, they, because of course, when the stomata are open, these nutrients can pass through. And again, we still have cuticle on the outside that does go down and into the stomata. So we, we now see that the nutrients, they are attracted and they will actually kind of stick to these guard cells and um, kind of transverse along there and pass ultimately through into the plant. So therefore stomata need to be open for us to optimize this pathway. And we need to target the foliar spray to the underside of the leaves where the stomata are and when they're open in order to ensure that we are optimizing this pathway uh, for, for uptake as well. So um, then let's get to the kind of the nitty gritty of understanding some of these variables to avoid the spray and pray. There's four things to think about here. Uh, I, I kind of summarize this into an acronym of FACE, formulation, 
application, crop and environment, F-A-C-E. You need to think about all four of these categories, um, how you formulate, uh, how you apply, what crop uh, you apply and the environmental conditions. And I think especially the, we need to pay close attention to the formulation, what goes into the spray mix, and then the environmental conditions of when we apply that. These are the two absolute key pieces that we have perhaps more control over. Um, although of course application is really important too. But um, so, okay, some of the things to consider here um, with formulation. Here, we're talking about the spray mix. So are the nutrients soluble? Nutrients that are fully soluble will pass through the leaf more faster than, for example, some of the kind of liquid limes or um, liquid gypsum, some of those micronized type materials. Now they can still pass through, but they take a little bit more time. They're not as fast. So if we want rapid absorption, the full solubility of the minerals, the, the nutrients, the better. And also really important is then the concentration of which we apply those. Again, this is somewhat contested, but um, the, the principle here is, is that we want a fairly concentrated, strong, concentrated spray mix, as strong as we can, obviously, without it burning, uh, being too salty and burning. But the, the argument is that we want a very, fairly strong concentration of the nutrients. And that's for the reason that when we apply that foliar spray onto the leaf surface, when that's applied on, for example, um, the way in which it passes through that cuticle, for example, that we were, saw just earlier, the way in which that nutrient passes through is actually through a concentration gradient, a passive concentration gradient. So what that means is that when we apply the foliar spray to the leaf surface, if we have a nice high, strong concentration of that nutrient onto the leaf, then we have a high concentration on the outside of the leaf where we've just applied, and if we have a limitation or we're trying to get that nutrient into the leaf, if we have a lower concentration inside the leaf, then we have a concentration gradient. We have a high concentration on the outside. We have a low concentration on the inside of the leaf. Now we have a concentration gradient and that is what will drive the absorption. The nutrients will move from a high concentration to a low concentration. It's going back to some of your high school chemistry, putting salt in water with a membrane or whatever, if you put it in one side, it will equilibrate out. The salts will move through um, that, that kind of principle. So um, it's that along those lines. So we want a high concentration on this foliar spray to drive the up, a rapid uptake. And it's that's again, the higher the concentration, the faster the speed of that uptake. Now, the way this comes into some contention is that of course, as the foliar spray begins to dry down, as water is evaporating off, we are making that water droplet more and more concentrated as the water is evaporating. So the argument is at some point as the water is evaporating, you will get to the optimum concentration for absorption into the leaf. So many people feel that they've had good success with foliars using fairly dilute kind of sprays. Um, uh, and that's kind of part of the reason why. But um, nonetheless, it's still an important consideration um, one way or another. The spray pH, uh, and okay, EC is really talking about the concentration there, but um, spray pH is definitely another really important one. I think um, we've got to make the spray pH below six as a maximum, really, uh, really ideally down around five, five to 5.5. 5. Uh, and most of the nutrients are absorbed better under more acidic conditions. So I think acidifying the spray mix all the way down to five, five and a half, is optimum, but certainly a maximum of six, uh, I would say. Um, this is an important one. Carbon, we're gonna talk about that quickly. And of course, things like wetter stickers, I would just as a standard practice, always encourage um, to ensure that we stick those droplets to the leaf. Um, application, I won't dwell on this because this is the stuff, standard practice that you're all gonna be doing anyway. Choose the right nozzle not too coarse so it falls to the floor, not too fine so it drifts off in the wind, not too much pressure so that the droplets bounce off. Um, standard spray considerations, uh, I would just, uh, you know, hand over to your farmers to, you, you know what you're doing in this space. But just to emphasize that generally with foliar sprays, you can go a little more on the coarser nozzle size. It's some of the pesticides that do need a finer mist. Uh, finer nozzles, but for foliars, you can be a little bit more medium um, kind of nozzle size uh, as a general rule. Okay, the crop, uh, this is things like crop stage. So younger leaves generally absorb a little more effectively than older leaves. Uh, leaf surfaces, 
as I mentioned, um, so again, example of brassicas, you know, they have those very waxy leaves. Uh, they're very repellent to, to, to the droplets to stick. So definitely including wetter stickers with brassicas. Um, but you can see that, you know, some very waxy leaved plants are more repellent of those droplets, uh, whereas other plants less so. So um, generally brassicas, you see maybe a slightly less of a response with foliars because of that waxy nature, but uh, that can be overcome with, a, with the wetter sticker. Uh, for example. So just to say different crops do respond differently. And as I mentioned with the trichomes example there, um, you know, there's a potential there to be breeding varieties in the future with ha which have lots of trichomes on them and then being important sites for absorption, uh, particularly in sunflowers, say um, we can breed varieties with lots of trichomes, therefore varieties that become more responsive to these low input, high efficiency foliar applications. And then the environment. So the big one here is the time of day and the humidity. And I, I touched on that earlier um, with the micropores open during humid conditions. And of course, the stomata are going to be open during humid conditions. If it's too hot, they will close those stomata. So we've lost one of the two kind of one of the three main pathways um, of uptake when the stomata are closed. So you want humid conditions. So early morning, and, early, and late afternoon, early evening. Remember that stomata close at the nighttime. So, I, you know, there's a question mark how, how effective the nighttime really is, but, you know, late afternoons, early evenings, um, but early morning, um, I think when high humidity is high is really, really important. Um, okay, extreme temperatures don't apply over 25, to, certainly 28, I wouldn't apply over 28 degrees Celsius, maybe 25 if you can. Um, and even light, presence of light has been shown to enhance foliar uptake. So that could be an argument for prioritizing morning application over uh, the, the afternoons. Okay, um, time is ticking so fast. Okay, I, I'll have to skip through a few slides here just to catch up and so we have time for questions. But just to say that in terms of the formulation, I just want to emphasize the importance of including a carbon source rather than apply nutrients on their own, apply a carbon source with them and form these chelates or these complexes, bind the nutrients up um, to form uh, a complex. And of course, this is, I gave this example of urea and amino acids having carbon embedded, which is why they pass through better. And this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to wrap it up in carbon um, so that it will uh, pass through those leaf surfaces more effectively. And this is where we use things like chelates. And again, amino acid chelates are really good for this. We're just trying to bind to the nutrient with some added compounds, which um, particularly carbon atoms, which will support a more rapid uptake. Uh, and what we're particularly doing is neutralizing the charge of the cation or the anion with a complex. And that's the key thing. We're trying to neutralize that charge uh, because it is the charge, the positive or the negative, the cation or the anion, that can slow down that uptake. So when we neutralize the charge, we see rapid uptake. So um, this is true of both foliar and root absorption. And then we see better translocation. That was the question also. When we have, for example, amino chelated or carbon chelated nutrients, they're also more mobile. This is how the plant moves nutrients around in chelated forms. Um, so whatever, iron, zinc, magnesium attached to amino acids, or again, iron citrates or iron malates, uh, sugars, these kinds of things, acids that are attached to um, the nutrient is how these things become more mobile. So you will get better translocation after application with chelates. Um, chelates also have to lower the salt index, so less burning. And in some instances, that can be a beneficial thing to create a slight slow release um, mechanism. My weapon of choice here is definitely amino acids uh, or even urea as a chelate. Um, but amino acids, things like fish hydrolysates, I think are awesome for this. Um, but again, you could use any of these types of things, molasses, um, sugars, they're fine, humic fulvic acids, amino acids, protein hydrolysates, seaweeds, kelps, they've got some great chelating compounds in there, other plant extracts, other compost leachates, anything like that. I mean, th these are ballpark application rates, consult label rates of the product that you're sourcing, but any kind of carb additive, ca carbon additives like this uh, would be advantageous. Um, just to say for a foliar approach, fulvic is the preferred over humic. Humic is great down in the soil and you can use it for foliar. Uh, fulvic is down, uh, is okay down in the soil, but it's better for foliar. And the reason being is that the fulvic is a smaller 
compound and smaller size means that it passes through the leaf faster more effectively so fulvic is the preferred weapon of choice uh, for foliars as a general rule um, okay so here's that slide again um, just kind of giving another example but uh, fleshing out now with the added information sure if you're going to use urea but it could be uan or yeah, again ua uh, uas as i mentioned earlier urea is my personal preference um, uh, you know here's just an example formula it's just an example you know, throw some trace elements in there, whatever the, lab, the product is at the label rates. If you wanted to do DIY, sure, throw in a bit of iron for photosynthesis, maybe manganese, one of, you know, a couple of those, depending on what else you might need. If you know you need something else, use some zinc sulfate or a bit of bor soluble, anything. Like you could make your own, sure. Um, but I think if you wanted to use like a multi-trace kind of package, that sounds good. You've got all the traces there to kind of work with that nitrogen fish uh, throw in some organic nitrogen some amino acids amino chelates that kind of thing and then throw in a carbon source and sure it could be fulvic, it could be molasses it could be anything um, again just follow label rates and you know maybe magnesium sulfate a bit of epsom salts if you want to prime photosynthesis maybe some potassium sulfate if you're feeling grain you know use your tissue test use your sap analysis um, to kind of tweak the additives or the synergies that will uh, come into come into this Okay, um, I might actually just close there. All I was going to emphasize in this last section was to say that through this photosynthetic process, the plant also produces root exudates. And um, I'm going to skip through these slides just to say that therefore foliars can also help to prime root exudates. And when we prime root exudates, we are priming uh, microbial feeding and nutrient cycling down in the soil. So just to say that foliars are also indirectly about driving root exudates and about driving nutrient use efficiencies from the soil, leveraging the fertility that you have from the soil. That was the, all I really wanted to, to kind of emphasize there. I'm going to skip through a few of these slides. It was really just to emphasize that point. Foliars can help to drive root exudates to actually feed and, and stimulate the soil microbiology. So of course, I think I'll, I'll kind of squeeze this one in just to say that if we have, you know, we've got a couple together, foliars and soil health strategies. Think about the slightly kind of compacted soil. If we foliar spray and we prime root exudates into this tight compacted soil where we have compromised microbial activity, well, we're not gonna get a good response or a good feedback or a kickback from the soil biology when we feed them with those root exudates versus a, a well-structured soil, good soil health, where we have good roots and good microbial associations, where when we foliar spray prime root exudation, we actually feed the biology better, um, cycle more nutrients from the soil and deliver those back to the plant. So I think we've got to kind of bring together foliar and long-term kind of soil thinking. Okay, so in summary, a quick few pros and cons. Pros to foliar, it's more rapid absorption of as I touched on, so we can quicker alleviation of deficiency symptoms, quicker utilization assimilation, um, can be more effective than soil application for, for highly immobile nutrients like iron or foals would be another example. Reducing the runoff uh, associated with nitrates, for example, um, through foliars, we can deliver nutrition when the roots are impaired. So under high salt conditions or high drought conditions, when the root nutrient uptake from the roots is, is compromised, we can deliver those directly through the foliage. And a more uniform application for trace minerals. Um, and we can also use foliage to top up key nutrients during peak demand times. Now, let's not pretend that foliage is the be all and end all. It's just a tool and it could be used much better than we currently use it. I think it's a tool in the toolbox that we've got to bring together. But of course it has limitations. Um, which is fine. Every tool does. Uh, it's about understanding those and therefore using the tool within an integrated system um, to, its, to its most optimum. So, okay, of course, there is an upper limit to how much, how many units per hectare we can apply through the foliar that the plant can take up. So, of course, there's a cap there. And that may therefore mean that we see shorter lived benefits or we might need more repeat applications uh, of those foliar sprays. Uh, as we touched on, variable responses have definitely been seen. Um, that's why we want to avoid the spray and pray approach. Consider your formulation, get the concentration, add those carbon chelators, tweak the spray pH, and then apply it at the right time, early morning, uh, late afternoon, for example. Possibility of burning if the concentration is too 
if the solution is too concentrated. Um, and of course, weather can be more of a restriction with foliars than granular. If it is windy, rainfall, temperatures, humidity, you know, you don't want to go out in suboptimal conditions. So that does restrict you a little bit with, uh, with the foliar approach. Okay, so in summary, make sure you get a good ID, a correct diagnosis of your limitation. Uh, use a test, use a sap test, use a tissue test, identify what you actually require. Um, as I mentioned, spray formulation, use the nutrient solubility, the concentration, the carbon source, the spray pH, apply it those key, two key times. It's all about the humidity. This is the major factor. And uh, also consider some of your long-term soil health improvements at the same time. Okay, I, so apologies, I did go a little over than I wanted to. So hopefully we have enough time. Well, I'll try and keep my answers brief for the question time so we can hopefully get through them all. Um, hopefully we've got enough time. So thank you very much. No worries, Joel. Thanks very much for that. Uh, a lot of information in a short period of time. And as you said, we could uh, probably uh, pick each one of those sections and, uh, and do a whole webinar on, on each bit, but uh, that'll be for a future day. So I'll, most of the questions that come in, I think have been answered. Um, the one one question I, I sort of had was the timing, not so much the day or the evening or the night, but the time that you would do a, a application in the plant's development. So is it like, are you better off three or four days before it's going to hit, start to go reproductive, do something in and beef it up? Or is that is that important? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Good. That's a great question. Of course, it's going to be a little... Um different for different crops and, uh, and their particular nutrient requirements. But let's use an example of foliar nitrogen, which was one part of our case study. And as I say, I'm a little partial to for foliar urea, but um, there's no reason you couldn't use UAN or UAS. But um, I would say this, there's, there's two key windows that you want to hit um, for foliar nitrogen if you're, if you're also looking for protein. And the first one that is more of a yield builder is a foliar application. So the general rule is the earlier the nitrogen, the more yield building, the later the nitrogen, the more protein building. And the, if you're gonna build for protein, let's just hit that one first, your optimum time there is kind of right on um, anthesis, kind of towards the end of flowering, towards the end or straight after flowering. Some people go kind of mid flowering towards the end of flowering or straight after. And that uh, application right on, um, after anthesis, that's the one that, that really helps to build protein if that's the goal. So that's one key st stage there. If you're looking for yield, the other one um, earlier is uh, the big, there's a couple, I guess, earlier, but the, I guess the main big one is kind of right at just ahead of flag leaf or just onto an emerging flag leaf, just in front of flag leaf kind of thing. That's your kind of key window, trying to get lots of that foliar nitrogen to deposit into the flag leaf so that then it will be remobilized from that flag leaf up into the grain uh, later on. So that's your two. If, if it was something like malting barley or you wouldn't didn't necessarily want the high protein, you'd lean more another extra spray kind of earlier on there. You could do one around tillering. Uh, you could do one around stem elongation or around booting. All of those have kind of been shown to be uh, somewhat um, beneficial as well. So um, that would be a general rule for cereals on something like canola, actually foliar nitrogen, uh, again, actually towards the end of flowering has been shown uh, also to be beneficial for canola. And even on pulses, uh, as counterintuitive as it may seem, kind of straight after flowering, kind of around pod set, um, early kind of pod set, foliar sprays of uh, nitrogen have been shown to boost the protein. Obviously, you're just chasing protein there, so you can get a good protein bump with a foliar urea kind of around pod set on some of the legumes as well. And you would you would put those trace elements like your molly and that with them at the same time? Yes, correct, correct. Yeah, so the, the, the optimum way would be targeted precision nutrition, get a test done, and then just deliver the key things that you're actually, actually lacking along with that urea or along with that nitrogen. That would be your best way. But if you didn't have a test, yeah, I would use just something like a, a, a fairly kind of complete, um, you know, package kind of fertilizer to go with the urea, um, then those extra carbon additives. I would use something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a quick one on testing. Um, 
by the time we send it away, it gets done, it gets the it gets back to us. That might be um, ten days. Um, is that test still valid then, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's it's a good question. I mean, <laughs> every test has its um, <clears throat> you know strengths and weaknesses and, and pros and cons. And sure, let's not pretend that the tissue analysis or a SAP analysis is perfect. You know, they're not. Um, but they are rather than completely shooting in the dark, you know, they they take that possibility and kind of narrow it down and, and, and give us a bit more of a focal point. So I think that they're still very valuable. Um, but yeah, you're right. You choose a lab that you have happy customer service with that you feel like you get a good turnaround because that quick turnaround is really important. You want to be out there as quick as possible because things do change so rapidly. So I think that's a valid critique. But if I had a choice of doing that versus flying blind, I would still do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I th we, we did cover this one in a little bit. Uh, can you have too much of something? We did cover that with the urea, but um, yeah. How does that sort of work? And are there um, ones that are antagonistic to each other? So like boron and moly and those sorts of things, are they antagonistic to each other? Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Yes, you can. we can always over-apply anything. And um, uh, and actually, that's often a bit more of a problem with soil-based and, and um, root uptake um, kind of thing, particularly as well. But, um, but actually, I touched on that point about um, the concentration gradient driving the absorption. If you actually have adequate amounts of a particular nutrient in the leaf already, and then you apply more on top, um, if you already have a strong or a high concentration inside the leaf, you don't have as good of a concentration gradient between those two. So you actually don't see a strong kind of driving of that uptake of nutrients when they're already adequate. So that's part, so that's part of it. So you don't necessarily see such a big kind of thing associated with kind of toxicity, so, so to speak, but a, a little bit different in inferring the question in a slightly different way. Yes, of course, you can have antagonisms where if we do apply too much of a nutrient that it can be a little competitive for other nutrient uptake. So if it's sitting on the leaf, for example, it can still be competing for other similar kind of cations, for example, like some of the trace elements, there's, a, there's an element of a competition there. So it can kind of suppress or antagonize the uptake of some of the other elements. So that can be a, a negative. Um, and also even in the spray tank. So certain nutrients, of course, can react in the spray tank and kind of lock up with each other or precipitate out that kind of thing as well. So, so yes, you do need to be careful about, for example, mixing high concentrations of FOS and some of the trace minerals. They can form like a copper phosphate or a, a zinc phosphate. Or um, So you can get away with small amounts. Um, and again, if those nutrients are chelated or wrapped up in carbon first, then they're less likely to react and precipitate out. So that's why it's really important to use those carbon-based kind of inputs and chelated inputs, because that also helps to prevent uh, some of those antagonisms as well. Yep. Uh, the one thing uh, also, um, what have I done there? Um, I find quite often when we use, um, say, a liquid vermicast with, with the trace elements or with, with a foliar effort, we have really good take up. What is, is there a reason for that? Mm, yeah, sure. It would be um, some of those humic substances uh, coming out of the vermicast. So you would have kind of naturally occurring humic and fulvic acid type compounds. You, equally, you would have a lot of amino acids, organic forms of nitrogen. A lot of those amino acids would be coming out of any kind of a vermicast or a compost or manure leachate. You'll have aminos in there and you'll have some of these humic type substances, these carbon chains, carbon compounds. And yeah, that's exactly it. They're doing a chelation for you. They're wrapping up and binding to the nutrients, providing carbon embedded, um, neutralizing the charge, and therefore improving uh, improving the uptake of those. So, so of course, vermicast is often used as a biological input for the microbial component. But indeed, you can use especially vermicast compared to a normal compost vermi through the action of the worm. They have really much better quality humic substances in a vermicast than a normal compost. So um, I would I would argue, yeah, so you're really, you're using that more for the chemistry and maybe less for the biology in that instance for some of those humic substances or carbon chelating compounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Melinda 
Turner, she was the, the put through the first question about the mobility of um, of the trace elements. And she's put in here like specifically on trace elements. Um, um, are there like the mobility on specific, like your minor trace elements, I suppose, like moly, copper and those sorts of things? Millennium. Yeah, so they, yeah. yeah, I guess, as I kind of mentioned, they're a little bit more in that intermediate range. And yeah, that's, it's, it is a little hard to answer the question because, um, yeah, it's the different in different contexts. Um, selenium, things like, um, yeah, and, and some of those minor elements like, say, for example, selenium, which are, you know, again, more beneficial uh, and less, um, necessarily essential. We, we certainly know a lot less of, but, but selenium, for example, it, it forms amino acids there, selenomethionine and selenocysteine, and it actually does have um, good mobility when it's coming into the plant, but it, it generally has a, a tendency to be deposited in some of those um, younger leaves where it is then kind of remains. But yeah, it, it does kind of, there's a lot of very, I can see why she's asked the question is, it, um, I don't think we have all of the answers for all the specific crop types, especially with some of those minor ones, which are required in such micro uh, tiny quantities as well. Um, uh, but you're also right that some of those are less um, absorbed through the foliars. You know, we often talk about oh, calcium is not so well absorbed through the foliar. Uh, well, it can be absorbed, but then not so good at being then translocated. And I just, I think there's just a little bit of gray area on, I'm sure that's a good general rule, um, uh, but the gray area there is it just depends on that form of the calcium, you know, and again, if it's, if it's bound to amino acids, chelated in the right way, that can very much change the mobility. And I, there's some really interesting studies, I, I, can't, I shouldn't go on and on, but um, that kind of now we have tools and technology to look at leaf samples and actually not just identify the zinc that's there and how much is there, but also look at what form the zinc or the selenium or the moly or the cobalt is in, is it attached to, for example, um, <clears throat> some citric, <clears throat> like a zinc citrate or a zinc malate or a zinc phytate. So what form is the zinc? We can actually start to untangle rather than just the tissue analysis that tells you how much zinc is there. We can see what form that zinc is. And that is what changes the mobility hugely. So it's not just about the total zinc. Okay, zinc phytate is a storage compound. The plant will, that's highly immobile. It's kind of being locked away as a storage um, where then the plant will unlock that at a later stage forming zinc citrates or zinc malates, which are then more mobile, for, for example. So there's this real nuance here in terms of it depends on the form of the nutrients. Some are then less or more mobile. And this is kind of generation two, it goes way beyond our Kind of our general guidelines of oh this nutrient is mobile or not uh, the classic things that i kind of partly answered your question with generation two is really diving into what form is that nutrient and now we're tapping into the different mobilities of those different forms so it's a much more complex picture than the general rules of thumb that we that we often talk about yeah fantastic uh so leslie papworth uh has a question here about the moisture, like if water is your limiting factor, is, is there a point in doing a foliar application? Mm, yeah, great question. So um, yes and no. Actually, foliar, I, I'd mentioned that, that actually foliars can be a really useful tool to help during stressful condi conditions when root uptake is impaired. And so moisture is a, is a classic example, drought is a classic example of this. So what we see is that um, when the plants are growing in dry soil, they can't get soil water. They also can't get the nutrients that come with that water. And so when we see drought symptoms, a drought stressed plant, you're actually seeing two issues there. One is a water stress and a nutrient stress. It is a combined stress. So drought stress is dual, both of those. So by foliar spraying, we can at least deliver the mineral component in, the nutrient component in, and help alleviate the nutrient stress, which can help the plant through that stressful time. And of course, okay, we're supplying a little bit of water as well there, um, of course. So the answer to the question is, in the early stages of drought stress, yes, foliars can be very beneficial. You deliver the nutrients um, while the soils are beginning to dry out, helping the plant hold on for longer in those drying conditions. However, up until a point, 
once we reach late stage drought stress, you know, the plant is just shutting down. Um, everything is shutting down and therefore leaf uptake of any nutrients also shuts down. So, so the answer is yes, it can be very beneficial in the earlier stages of drought stress. And that can sometimes mean giving the plant an extra week or two holding on, you know, or longer, you know, just depends before while we're maybe waiting for rain. Um, it can make the difference sometimes. So, so in the early stages, yes, but after a point, yeah, there's not much point. Yep. Uh, just got one here from um, about aerial application. So cutting back on the on the water, and it's obviously, I suppose that comes back to the translocation through the plant. Um, yeah, because you're, you're um, probably not getting as good a coverage in the, mm. the dilution. Cutting back on the water affect the dilution. Yeah. Sure. Um, Okay, so yeah, and that can be, I kind of touched on that a little bit. So that, of course, with, a, with an airplane, you're generally going to be using a, a slightly less volumes of water. And um, now that can be a real advantage because, as I mentioned, yes, the more concentrated the spray mix, when that hits the leaf, uh, you've got a, that stronger concentration gradient to drive the uptake. So the stronger, the better in that sense. But of course, up until a point, as long as you know that you're not going to cause burn, any kind of a burn or a scorch from, as you lower the water rate, you're increasing the, the salt index, the concentration, the EC or the saltiness. So that is a potential mechanism for burn. Now you can compensate that with carbon-based additives, put some fulvic acid to bind amino acids to chelate. That also helps to lower that saltiness. So those are the tools that you can kind of use. Um, but yes, you can lower the water rate, that's okay. It can be a positive thing because uh, it's more concentrated, faster uptake, um, just as long as you don't um, burn. So if you've got experience at that volume of water and you know that it's okay, then, um, then yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well, I think that's most of the um, most of the questions that were there that we've answered. Did we miss any there, uh, Jess, that you saw, or um, um, not that I can really see? When we were talking about the uptake, there was someone that just suggested is humid conditions best when you're actually spraying a foliar. Yes, yes. You, that's as I mentioned. That's why you want early morning and late afternoon. So the and that's it's not about the time. It's about the humidity. You want the humidity. That is the key driving uh, factor that influences that uptake. So, so yes, humid conditions. And sure, if it was a cool day, hum uh, cloudy, cool day, you could be out there applying in the middle of the day. You know, that's okay. If it was cloudy day, if it was also good humidity. Uh, for sure, uh, that's also a perfectly good time to do it. It's the humidity is the key driving factor. Yes. Yeah, very good. Um, anything else uh, that we need to cover, Darren? Or looks all right, mate. I, there was just one here from an earlier uh, one here. Someone that suggested that Elaine Ingham doesn't think you should apply sulfur, but instead humic acid. And what are Joel's thoughts on that? I think you change that to amino that well. acids as well. Yeah. Um, I, unless she means to the soil, I mean, humic acid would have a, a tiny amount of sulfur in it. Um, but certainly humic acid to the soil can then stimulate the release of certain nutrients. But I'm not familiar with the idea that humic acid would somehow substitute salt he did change that a bit further on he put in amino acids oh so, sorry amino acids yeah, yeah. So, but, but, okay, so amino acids. Acids. yeah okay so sure yeah i mean i so i kind of touched on that in a slightly indirect way um highlighting that yes amino applying amino acids and proteins is very energy efficient because it's further up that metabolic pathway. So you're saving all of that hassle down the bottom of the pathway with converting the nitrates and the urea and the ammonium, et cetera. And we're just delivering aminos directly in. Um, so sure, I would agree with that. But of course, you've got to be ensuring that you're talking about the sulfur bearing amino acids. And there's only a couple of those. Um, most of the amino acids are not sulfur bearing. So you'd have to be rather specific about which aminos you're applying and that they are the sulfur bearing ones. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure you, okay, so it depends on the extent of your deficiency. I'm not sure they would provide enough sulfur, maybe for a mild sulfur deficiency, sure. Uh, whether or not it would be enough, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, should they be maybe part of that picture? Yes, uh, 
Um, they're great sources of sulfur because they're already in the amino acid form, uh, which is exactly why amino acids are great sources of nitrogen for the same reason, because that nitrogen is already in the amino acid form. So yeah, I agree with that in that context, just a question of whether or not it would be, um, there would be enough, enough sulfur there. Um, I saw this other question here from uh, Melinda, how to modify the spray pH. Yeah, my, my weapon of choice there is citric acid. I don't think I did mention that. So I would use citric acid to lower the pH, um, which is probably usually what you're going to need. Um, you could, in yeah, some, in some instances, you might need to increase the, the spray pH. But as I say, normally more on the acidic range is, is better. Yep, uh, fantastic. I think we've covered them all, Luke. Yep, no worries. Well, once again, Joel, thanks so much for your knowledge uh, and also to Darren and Best Farming Systems Australia for helping us put this, put these on and bringing this information to everybody. Um, I, I really appreciate the help from, from you guys uh, to be able to uh, bring this knowledge to people. Um, anyway, from me, that's, that's it. Um, Joel, have you got any last words of wisdom you'd like to put out or uh <laughs> i know i guess i would just wish you all a good season ahead i hear you've, you're lining up to have some pretty reasonable moisture again um fingers crossed so um yeah i wish wish you all well and uh yeah i guess i think my final parting message there is just to emphasize this idea of kind of more complete plant nutrition thinking in a holistic, don't just manage nutrients in isolation, really use, build the bigger picture and manage them all. They're all important. They all work into, interconnectedly and um, consequently we need to be managing them all. So um, get out of that kind of boxed in thinking and, and kind of look at the bigger picture and manage them, them all. And uh, use those tips we talked about, especially the carbon-based inputs, the spray pH, and then those spraying and human conditions. I think that's the, the kind of the big tips there. I think it, um, Joel, puts the farmer back a little bit in control of their program. And um, if things stop happening, you know, they stop spending money on, on, on their program, you know. So there's less risk involved as well. And if things are going along well, you can, you know, so I guess it puts them in a little bit more control rather than putting everything that the plant needs up front and spending all that money. Absolutely, absolutely. And that goes both ways. You know, spoon feeding is a really good idea because putting it up front, it's more prone to those losses, uh, leaching or volatilization. So, you know, using a few more regular foliars provides that opportunity to kind of spoon feed and gain efficiencies that way. And it's all about gaining efficiencies when prices are as they are. But as you point out, Darren, yeah, it, it gives you that opportunity to kind of read the season and play it accordingly. Um, you know, why put all that fertilizer up front if then you're going to go and have a dry year? Um, it's a, that's a poor way to manage your, your risk. Whereas at least with foliars, we can start, start small with your inputs, get things established, see what happens with the rainfall through the season. And if it comes good, okay, top up through the foliars. Um, if the conditions are good and you know that you can justify those expenses. If it stays dry and it's not looking favorable, well, you can hold back on that expenditure. So you're right, it really does give you that flexibility um, to kind of be more in control. And that's critical in seasons like this when prices are as they are. Yeah, very true. Joel, yep. thank yep. you so much for um, your wisdom again. Like you've said, Luke, thanks again for, for co-hosting it with us as well. And Jess, thanks for the, the inputs as well, for, for everything you've done as well. Anything you want to say, Luke? Yeah, I just saw one one last question uh, that I did write down earlier. So, when you're doing a foliar application, let's say you're a you, you don't have cover, like you might be at three or four leaf stage, and there's not a lot of um, foliage there. Do you just wind back the amount of um, yes nutrition that you put out? Yeah, for sure. You would in that instance, kind of you would also go yeah, you dial it back and therefore go out a little bit more dilute as well. Um, just on some of those very young and kind of tender leaves. But yeah, you wouldn't want to use full application rates. There's no point in that until you've got really good canopy closure where you're going to catch all of that foliage, intercept all of that foliage spray. So if you've still got bare soil, then yeah, there's, there's an opportunity there to kind of lower the rates a little accordingly. Yep. Fantastic. All righty. Well, thanks very much, Joel. Thanks, Thank Darren. You. I'll get this all uploaded too, so you can re-look at it if you need to. So.
Yeah, we'll do that in the next couple of days. So it takes a long time to load it up, doesn't it, Jess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Okay, thanks for your time, everyone. Cheers. Bye.